Good morning, everyone, and it's my honor today to welcome you and kick off this day. I am among HR practitioners today. I will not delve too much into telling you what to do and what we need to do. What I'll do today is share a little bit of my experience and a little bit of my understanding of what diversity and inclusion means and what we as an organization need to strive for. I'm glad that all of you have taken time off and joined us in this journey today. I call it a journey because it's not started today. It started at a time when the words like diversity and inclusion were not mainstream. And I hope we end it not too much uh, away in future at a day where words like diversity and inclusion become obsolete and irrelevant. We're able to create a workplace where these are norms and not something that we are striving towards. Thank you as we start this journey. To begin with, I want to start with this slide. How many of you are familiar with this movie? How many of you have seen this, enjoyed this? This is one of my favorite movies, In and Out. Why did I bring it out here today? To me, there is a deep connect between this movie and the topic that we have in hand. For those who have seen uh, In and Out, and for those who haven't, these are characters inside our mind helping us work together. So what we have here is we have uh, sorrow, we have uh, in green dis uh, disgust, we have joy, anger, and fear. These are all characters inside Riley's head. They all have different personalities. They all have different temperaments. They're all functioning in different manner. But together, they make Riley successful. Together, they're able to make Riley manage a crisis. To me, an organization is something very, very similar. We need diverse opinions. We need diverse people. We need diverse experience. We need people with different risk aptitude. And together, in an inclusive environment, they can really make it work. And that's the reason why we are sitting here today. That, that's what we felt, but well, data says that so. We did a quick survey, you know, we work with many of the organizations and we are consultants, so we love to put up data. Most of the organizations that we spoke to have seen an improvement in innovation with inclusiveness and diversity in their agenda. There has been higher talent retention, Millennials have brought in a lot of fresh thought. Companies are seeing better brand awareness. And 100% of them believe that this is the right investment to make. So when we talk about diversity, what do we mean? We, talk, we, we, we mean that we need the men in the organization. We need the women in the organization. We need the LGBTQ, people with disability, different ethnic origins, different religious diversity. We need them all. So Riley's head needs them all, not just to function, but to flourish. We've spent a little bit of time here talking about diversity. I want to take a moment, pause here, and ask each one of you, how many of you have ever felt this way? Like you do not fit in. Like there is this gap, you're there, but you're not there. I think most of us have had these experiences all our lives, right? I myself have moved from cities to city while growing up. I moved from different cultures to different languages, and it was a challenge. For me, many of these months were quite traumatic. For moving from different, like a Christian Catholic school to a Tamil Brahmin school is, is not an easy adjustment. More often than not, in the first few exams, I did not perform to my fullest. I felt lonely, I felt insecure, often inadequate. What we need to understand is to be uh, feeling excluded. You do not need to be a part of the minority. You could be very much mainstream, but there are aspects about you that people are judging, which is making you feel the way you are. So for, for me, exclu feeling excluded is as much as, that, as much about an LGBTQ or a PW, uh, you know, per person with disability, as much as it is for us to assume that a man is going to be more aggressive towards his career and less responsible towards his family. Because when we are making that assumption, we are judging that person and making him uncomfortable about the expectations from him. So exclusion 
can actually come in many forms than we expect us to, us to uh, than we believe, rather. So imagine when there are a bunch of people in your organization who are constantly feeling this way, constantly or maybe a large part of their work hours. Forget the human part of it. Just from a productivity point of view, how do you expect an organization to function successfully if there are a set of people there who do not seem like they fit in, who are unable to give their fullest to the exams at hand, if I have to just draw similarity to what I experienced. That is being inclusiveness. Inclusive, sorry. I want to take another small layman, and like I said, I'm going to be speaking the layman language because I'm bringing in the perspective of an employee here. Um, in another layman language, if I have to explain what to us, to me, is the difference between diversity and inclusiveness. So let's say you host a party for your class. Let's say you're in school and you host a party for your class. You invite everybody there to the party. You have ensured that there's diversity, that there is nobody who's not invited. But once at the party, when you invite each person to join the dance floor and have a blast, that's when you're ensuring inclusiveness. So it's not just about being there. It's about how you feel when you're there. And to me, this, this is the difference between diversity, inclusiveness, and both together is what we ultimately need to strive for. Why do we need diversity? Why are we talking about this? I don't want to talk re-emphasize and re it. Just look at the talent spread here. Is this something that we want to miss out? I don't think I need to say more. But well, I will say a little bit more. If the pictures on the uh, you know, screen were not, uh, em did not emphasize the need enough, we also have some data. India is going to face a skill labor gap of 109 million in 2022. Today, our uh, ability to get everybody into an active workforce and be productive is going to significantly help us fill this gap. Now, data and research shows that an organization which is more diverse is almost twice as ready as a less diverse organization, 1.8 times to be precise, but twice as ready almost to take on change. They're also nearly as much more ready as a non-diverse organization to take on innovation. If we are counting money and profitability, most business units which are more diverse have seen higher profits. Companies with more women on their board have consistently outperformed companies with less women on their board. Uh, attrition, of course, I think most of us, there we have HR practitioners, we have enough data to believe that women bring in the sense of semblance and the sense of calm, if I may, so not me, I think I bring, bring more um, chaos to the organization, but then there are many who do. Uh, to make the environment far more uh, sustainable, far more amicable for the team to you know, continue working and continue flourishing. And more importantly, research shows that there is a cascading effect. Companies which have less diversity go and foster less and less diversity. So if you are already less diverse, you will lose more women, you will lose your ethnic minorities, and you will lose people because the organization has not learned how to deal, deal with differences. So, so now we've spent some time talking about data, information, pictures, all of that, on why diversity is important and why we need to be inclusive. Let's look at the current state now, right? We've spoken for a while on what's the importance, but where are we today? Overall, in tech companies, the gender diversity in, in, the, in the world is about 31%. In India, we are at about 21%. There is a pay disparity overall in the globe, which is much higher in India. And attrition among men and women is also different. However, I want to bring in an interesting point here. While you see attrition is higher among women, tenure is typically also higher among women, whereas they are, they are sometimes 
leaving the workforce, they're staying in the organization more. So the efforts that you take in investing in two women can, be, can go a longer way in building your capability and your ability to drive the organization's growth. So what really are the challenges, right? At the entry level, of course, there is a funnel issue, right? So while till your secondary education, girls are consistently doing better than men, the boys, at the STEM education level, about only 30% of the seats are filled by women. That's not that bad, you know? It's not that bad. If you look at something like US, when, when I have the same discussion in US, it's much less. It's only 10 to 15%. So we have a base of 30%, which is not that bad a base to work with. But the challenge here is how it impacts going forward, right? So you see how we're moving from 25 to 30% to 20% to less than 10% in the leadership roles. So it's, it's basically the mid career stage where we are you know, losing a lot of women to multiple responsibilities that they're trying to deal with. There are the personal responsibilities, of course, of maternity, family response. And there are the professional challenges of being able to keep up with the new tech uh, stack, continue to be relevant, expectations of being aggressive, so as to call it workplace. Now, these are still solvable problems. If you see that families today have become more supportive. Spouses are, in many cases, taking on more responsibility. Companies are conscious. They are putting in programs. They, of course, need refinement. There are some blocks that are yet to be put in place. But then we are getting there. Where I see a significant challenge is with the third set of people, which is women who are moving into the leadership and the executive role. I think it's a fair assumption for us to make that women who've kind of gone through the mid-career crisis are tough. They are in a position to take on the org politics as well as, you know, deal with the old boys club, so as to call. But even then, there are challenges. If I look at myself, I have so many instances in my mind when I know that my male colleagues would have dealt with the situation very differently. They would have been more assertive. They would have put through their case in a very, very different style than what I did. I got what I wanted, but I'm talking about the journey and the effort and the investment that women land up making to get there. That's what becomes challenging. Now, given that, you know, genetically we are different, we, have, we will have different styles, and that's the advantage of diversity. But what's important is for the organization to understand that it's a different style. It's not a capability issue. And then help them nurture and ensure that they're being able to bring in that difference to the organization while investing into their own career. So those are some of the main challenges that we have. Of course, during our discussion going forward, we'll hear many more specific ones. When we take the next set of uh, community that I believe adds a lot to our diversity. That's the LGBTQ group. If it may be very, very hard for us to imagine that close to 30 million of our working population fall in this category. It may be a hard fact for us to comprehend because people around, a lot of people who work with us are not necessarily out of the closet. They have not openly talked about it. Also, in a country like India, there is this isolated society where people are, uh, you know, living their own lives, not, not mixed into the mainstream. And that's why to many of us this number is alarming, but it's a fact. And the challenges are multifold. There are legal issues, there are psychological issues, as well as practical policy-related issues. We've come a long way from uh, a few years back when most people did not think of an anti-discriminatory policy in this area. Now, today, about 50% of the LGBTQ population is covered by anti-discriminatory laws at the workplace. One thing that we need to understand here is while, unfortunately, in India, uh, LGBTQ relationships are still uh, considered as criminal offense, help having policies and non-discriminatory environment for them is not. Right? 
So that's a small effort that each one of us can take to make the environment more conducive. Most people, most uh, people in the LGBTQ uh, community have left their current employment because they felt uncomfortable, they felt uh, unfulfilled, and they felt distrusted. Now, if that is something that we can do from our end to help them uh, feel better at the workplace and feel integrated and feel like there are no different, imagine the impact that we will have. Apart from that, if we have methods to gainfully employ this community, imagine the amount of people we will bring back into the mainstream workforce. Today, they're forced to live in uh, you know, uh, isolated uh, uh, life, and maybe there are only few professions where they are very openly accepted with open arms. That's the status today, and there are small changes that we need to do. What are the challenges? You know, the funnel itself for them is, slow, uh, is lower, and then there are multiple challenges once they come into the workforce. So what are some of the challenges? Challenges are both with the environment that we present to them, as well as their own sense of self-doubt or their own consciousness about how they will be judged. We have to really understand that it's our bias and our limitation that we are going to confuse someone's sexuality or, someone or someone's choices with maybe their capability or morality. Please understand these are very different things. If you are feeling uncomfortable, if somebody in the organization is feeling uncomfortable because of X, Y, Z sexuality, please understand that not everybody from the opposite sex is, or the opposite gender is, is, is uh, you know, if everybody from the opposite gender is not behaving with you that way, why would this person be any different? And that's the discomfort that we need to break in people's mind. Very importantly is self-doubt and self-stigma that people feel, the LGBT community feel. This is very unfortunate that there are a lot, you know, the studies show that people who are openly out are, you know, 73% more productive than people who are not because they're not spending their time trying to, uh, you know, put on an act, maintain a certain sense of what we call as normalcy and hiding their personal life from people. So there's a lot of overhead gone from their lives to focus on what's important, which is the work at hand. So that, so, so these are the kind of issues that we need to deal with. It's our discomfort and our bias that's causing them. Uh, people with disability, the challenge is slightly different here. If we just look at the education levels, right, there are about 12 million people who are in the working age category, but only 1.6 million of them are, have had secondary education, which is very different from the country average. Our India average is 40% of the people have had secondary education. In case of people with disability, it's as low as 13%. So there is a lot of work on the grassroots level, of course. But once they're in the corporate, organizations, again, have to deal with some challenges. There are challenges around investing into technology to help them, challenges around investing into proper infrastructure. And then, again, our ability to understand that their disability with a certain physical function is, does not really limit them from their ability to perform certain tasks. It's our assumption that they will not be able to do it that causes more problems than others. Why do you think, I was spending some time trying to understand what is the origin, why, why is it so difficult for us to feel inclusive, in, be inclusive? Years of unconscious bias, we've all grown up with it. In our families, in our lives, in, our, uh, in our wor the world around us. We are wired to think that way. We see patterns and we map people to it. There are things that we know, there are things that we don't. And what we tend to do more often than not is fill in the blanks with our past experience rather than the data that we have in hand. The only way to get over unconscious bias is conscious effort. So as organization, we have to drill it into people till, of course, it becomes a habit. Fear of unknown. If we don't know how to deal with someone, if we don't know how to deal with something, we stay away. 
we are the only people at loss because we are unable to uh, get the fullest out of people just because we do not know or we assume that we do not know what his or her reaction is going to be. And last but not the least, and the most inexcusable one, of course, is the lack of empathy. Now, we are not going to have all the life experiences. We have our lives to lead and a, uh, and a limited set of experiences that we are going to live by. That does not mean that we are unable to respect somebody else's priorities. Somebody else chooses something does not mean he's less committed. She is less capable. It just means that they have chosen something that you have not. To me, the approach to building an inclusive and diverse organization has to be top down. It's same as what our parents do to instill our value system, right? You have to re review, reiterate, and reassert till it becomes everybody's problem and it becomes eventually everybody's habit. To me, you have to start with programs, you have to start with measures, you have to start with metrics, and slowly it's going to become seamless to the organization. We've come a long way from where we started a few years back. There are multiple programs in place, companies are doing a lot, some seeing impact, some are making changes so that the impacts become more apparent. There are forums for women to discuss, talk, seek help, mentorship. There are programs to celebrate individual, in the, pers the personal contributors to uh, female employees' life. More importantly, there are programs where you pick up high potential uh, candidates, senior people, and groom them, give them the required support to become, uh, build stronger business relationships and stronger influencing capability. When it comes to the programs that are being put in place for the LGBTQ community, I see more of the multinationals replicating their programs here. Um, it, it most likely will work because we are probably where the uh, US was a few years back and programs are going to be helping us. To me, uh, there has to be a three-pronged strategy to address this, right? So there has to be policies and procedures and benefits that help these people. But most importantly, there, are, there needs to be sensitizing programs. Now, there is always a risk in overstating something. It sometimes becomes um, uh, you know, uh, irrelevant to people. So that's why it's very important that it's not you and me just sitting together and planning these programs, but we have professionals involved in designing these programs. And third, most important, I won't call it support groups, but resource groups that employees can tap into to learn from each other's experience as well as talk to professionals and seek help and come, come out more self-assured and confident. When it comes to uh, the, the people with disability, the approach has to be slightly more holistic. Starting from uh, the sourcing and the hiring process where you have specific organizations, targeted uh, companies to tap into, doing an exhaustive job mapping within your organization and identifying which roles are suitable for what kind of people, investing into training and investing into technology to make the people with disability, and like I said, many of them need extensive training because unfortunately in that category, education, training, and counseling has been lower. To be able to take on these roles, and very, very importantly, the infrastructure for them to be able to use the office space adequately. I am, towards the end of my speech, I've talked about my experience, I've talked about what I believe are some of the right things to be done, and I'm looking forward to hear today from all of you on much more and learn much more on this topic. When we invited you today here, we invited you to the party. What I'm doing now is inviting you to the dance floor. Please join us in helping us choreograph this dance, which everybody can join in, no matter whether they have one left foot or two. And small steps that we take today will go a long way in creating an entire dance drama. I really hope that each one of us today here leaves with some small actionables that will help our lives and our organizations be a little bit more diverse and a little bit more inclusive. Thank you and I look forward to the sessions.